This video is sponsored by Skillshare. The K-pop industry is a colossus that's become South Korea's biggest cultural export. In 2018, K-pop contributed 3.8 billion to the country's GDP, a figure that's impressive on its own, but what's truly mind-blowing is that that money was brought in by the boy band BTS alone, so it doesn't account for the whole industry. Despite the fact that the majority of the world doesn't speak Korean, K-pop has transcended cultural barriers thanks to its fusion of modern stylings and a nostalgic callback to the boy bands and girl bands of the 90s and early 2000s. These artists are aspirational. They're talented singers and dancers with gorgeous looks, perfect hair and skin, amazing outfits, and they're adored by hundreds of millions of people across the world. Everything about their presentation is immaculate, from their public image to their seamless choreographed synchronized dance moves. Every aspect of them screams that they are an idol, worthy of your attention and, indeed, your money. K-pop bands have even had a presence in the diplomatic world. CL and EXO performed at the closing ceremony of the 2018 Pyeongchang Winter Olympics. South Korea's President Moon Jae-in invited EXO to meet with ex-President Trump when he visited the country, an occasion that fans of the band weren't too pleased about. Red Velvet were the first South Korean band in over a decade to perform in North Korea. When the Panmunjom Declaration for Peace, Prosperity and Reunification of the Korean Peninsula was signed in 2018, BTS even delivered a speech at the UN. I could go on, but at this point you get the picture that K-pop is huge, ridiculously profitable and culturally significant. However, given the importance of the genre, one might expect that the performers within it would be treated with the reverence and respect they deserve. Unfortunately, this is not the case. At this point, we're all very aware that the artists in creative industries such as music have been subjected to cruel treatments not just from fans and the press, but their labels and management too. In the West, we've recently become a bit more mindful of how we treat artists, but for the longest time, we were more than happy to hold performers to an impossibly high standard, while ignoring the fact that they were still human beings. In recent months, you may have heard of the Free Britney movement, which brought to light how Britney Spears has been under conservatorship by her father since her public breakdown in 2008, where she shaved her head and attacked a journalist's car. This didn't occur out of nowhere though. Britney Spears had been under the spotlight for years prior to this. Every single aspect of her life had been scrutinized since she was a child, and as this was happening, she had to hold up the veneer of a happy, well-adjusted star with a perfect life. Many idols within the K-pop industry are going through a similar treatment, where they're required to present themselves to the public as the label sees fit. This includes control over how they look, how they act, how they speak, and even the kind of relationships that they're in. On the surface, idols may be living the kind of lives that most of us would love to have, they're adored worldwide, they bring people joy, and they get to do all this while looking incredible and hanging out with their closest friends. But it's all manufactured, and like with many products, there's a human cost to their creation, a cost that has very tragically been fatal to some idols. Before we get started, I want to thank this video's sponsor, Skillshare. I'm sure you've probably heard about them at this point, but Skillshare is a fantastic online learning community with thousands of classes for creators, those looking to learn a new skill, and even brush up on your current discipline. Skillshare has something for everyone, whether you're a complete beginner or even a master at what you do. There's something to learn for everyone and new passions to be discovered. There's a huge selection of classes available, including creative pursuits such as animation, graphic design, photography, and film, and there's even classes that can help you grow in your daily life by improving your productivity or even how to become a more intuitive cook. Personally, I've been taking the class Mastering Illustration, Sketching, Inking, and Color Essentials. I used to draw a ton when I was younger, and I've been trying to get back into it recently, so Josiah Brooks's class has made returning to it much easier. It helped me figure out what kind of style I want to go for, and even get into coloring, which is great because I was always too afraid of that. Who knows, maybe after I'm done, I might share the results. Everything on Skillshare is fully curated, and each of its creators are experts in their field. There's no ads whatsoever, so you can 
stay focused on learning and developing with Skillshare's constantly growing selection of classes. We also have an active community of members where you can talk to them and even teachers to help each other grow even more. You can access all these fantastic classes on Skillshare for less than $10 a month for an annual subscription. And the first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a free trial of premium membership so you can explore your creativity. Learn something new today that you didn't know yesterday with Skillshare. Unlike other artists in the music industry, the majority of K-pop idols don't get into the industry by having a stage presence beforehand. They don't tour, release demo albums, or wait to be noticed by a scout. Instead, music labels will host auditions for those who wish to get into the industry. On paper, this may sound like a good idea given how it can be notoriously difficult to get signed. But in reality, this process is far more egregious. Those who audition are typically as young as 10 to 13 years old and have little autonomy of their own. Some may ask their parents to allow them to audition so they can become like the performers they idolize, but there are those who are coerced into becoming an idol by their parents in hopes of attaining fame and wealth. Regardless, this is a life-changing decision that's made at an extremely young age, but this works to the advantage of the label. By signing someone so young, it means that they're essentially able to mold a lump of fresh clay into whatever shape they would like, from their physical appearance to their personality. Those who are chosen to be idols can end up having to endure an intensive training regimen which can last over five years. Their dancing and singing practice sessions can start as early as 5am and go into the night as late as 10 or 11pm. They can also be placed on extreme or fad diets that don't have enough calories or nutrients to support their already physically demanding lifestyle. And when paired with an extensive daily workout routine, many idols have fallen ill or ended up being exhausted. In fact, the sight of seeing an idol faint while in the middle of a live performance isn't uncommon. As shocking as it may be to witness a performer collapse in front of the cameras or an audience of thousands. It's made all the more disturbing when their bandmates continue dancing and singing, seemingly unfazed by the sight of a limp body. The diets of K-pop singers could be considered the bare minimum that most people could survive on, and nowhere near enough for someone undergoing the rigorous routines of a K-pop performer. For example, the singer IU revealed back in 2013 that she adopted a diet that consisted of an apple for breakfast, two sweet potatoes for lunch, and a protein shake for dinner. She claimed that this helped her lose 5 kilograms in the space of 5 days, or 11 pounds. A generous estimate for the caloric intake for this would be a paltry 619 calories per day, less than half the recommended daily allowance for women. IU also revealed that she had become bulimic after experiencing anxiety, self-doubt and self-hatred, and most of her days would involve her eating excessively, sleeping and then vomiting. Thankfully, IU eventually addressed her mental health issues by seeking professional help, and although she still associates eating as a stress release, she now eats healthier. IU isn't an outlier though. Many idols within the K-pop scene have claimed to be on extreme diets for extended periods of time, and as a result, developed eating disorders. This includes both male and female performers, but women tend to be scrutinized the most given their fans and, by extension, society holds them to a higher standard of beauty. According to former K-pop trainee Euodius, this behavior is common to the point of being normalized in the industry, and many girls have to stay under the maximum weight of 47 kilograms, or 103 pounds, and disorders such as bulimia and anorexia lead to many of them no longer having periods. To give you some more examples, Kang Sora would eat a yogurt and an apple for breakfast, white rice and pumpkin porridge for lunch, and a sweet potato, lettuce, and a slice of toast for dinner. So Yu had a sweet potato for breakfast, three boiled eggs and a slice of toast for lunch, and three slices of kimbap for dinner. Seo Hyun had sweet potatoes, chicken breast, and boiled eggs as their single meal for each day. And the most extreme example I found was Park Shin Hai, who had one cucumber and a glass of low-fat milk for breakfast, half half a cup of brown rice and cabbage for lunch, and one cucumber and cabbage for dinner, which is approximately a total of 318 calories per day. Some idols will even undergo weekly or monthly assessments where they're weighed in front of their bandmates, and if they've been unable to lose weight or are over the required weight range, they can be publicly shamed or even shunned until they lose it. The demand for artists to stay skinny is one thing, but many labels will go a step further when it comes to the appearance of their performers. It's not uncommon for prospective 
respective idols to sign contracts that include clauses that require them to undergo plastic surgery. This can range from rhinoplasty or nose jobs, mandibuloplasty or jaw shaving, breast augmentation and blepharoplasty to remove excess skin from the upper eyelid and reduce bagginess from the lower eyelid. Skin bleaching is another common procedure among idols, where the skin tone is lightened to make someone look younger or even as though they're from an affluent background. As I mentioned earlier, these contracts are signed as young as 10 years old, which means that as an idol enters adulthood, if their appearance doesn't meet the expectations of the label, they can legally mold them into what they want. You may think that once idols have gone through the grueling training process that they'd be handsomely rewarded financially for their efforts when they debut, given how famous these artists become. But it's often the case where each singer, whether they're in a band or solo, will make poverty wages. The income split between the music label and artist could be as much as 80% to 90% for the label and 20% to 10% respectively to the artist, which is one of, if not the worst deals in the entire music industry. When this is with a solo singer, it's still an incredibly uneven and exploitative divide in the worker and employer dynamic. But this is significantly worse in the context of bands which have as many as three members, such as Triple H, or 13 members like the band 17. If you take a band with six members that brings in $1 million with a 90-10 split with their label, this means that the label receives $900,000 and the group receives $100,000, meaning that each member would get only $16,000. This is made even worse when you take into consideration that once idols have gone through the training process, most labels will immediately place them in debt and require them to pay back for their singing lessons, dance lessons, accommodation, exercise training, clothing, and more. Also, if you decide to drop out of training before you debut, you're still required to pay back the money they've spent on you. Some labels will forgive the cost of training upon completion, but this is rare, and they'll still require you to pay them back if you drop out prematurely. K-pop contracts aren't limited to the physical appearances of their artists though. Given that these are public figures, there are clauses which dictate how they're supposed to conduct themselves in front of the media and fans. This can include typical things such as not being able to disparage their label, bandmates or other bands, avoiding debaucherous behaviour such as drinking and taking drugs, and avoiding being seen in romantically and sexually charged situations. The latter rule extends further than their public image though, and many labels will demand that K-pop stars remain single while signed to them in order to make them appear romantically available to their fans, which is in itself a paradox and sexually exploitative since it uses singers as what could be described as relationship bait for their fans. In 2018, it emerged that Huna and Edorn from the band Triple H were in a secret relationship for two years despite their contract stating that they weren't allowed to. When it became public knowledge, Huna's contract was terminated while Edorn's future with the label Cube was briefly deliberated upon, establishing a clear double standard that while a male performer in a relationship may be marketable, a woman in one isn't acceptable. Shortly afterwards, it was decided that Edorn's contract would also be terminated and the group disbanded as a result. Despite music labels requiring their talent to be seen living a life devoid of romantic relationships or presenting themselves with desires for companionship, they still use sex appeal to market their idols. In the case of women, although among the hundreds of performers there's a spectrum of personalities on display, there are essentially two layers of how idols are supposed to be perceived by the public. The first layer is that they're supposed to be seen as strong, independent, and a full ownership of their sexuality. The second layer is that of a far more submissive and innocent woman that exists to pander to the male gaze, a term used to describe how women in the media are visually crafted by male producers to pander to heterosexual heterosexual males. Of course, there are people of other genders and sexualities that enjoy K-pop and how idols look and act, but this two-layer portrayal of women has existed long before K-pop, most notably with pop starlets in the West such as Britney Spears, Miley Cyrus, etc. Both men and women within K-pop are presented in this fashion, but women in particular are often portrayed in a patriarchal context as the paradoxically sexually experienced virgin, and this in turn turns them into a commodity to sell records and merchandise. As a result of this commodification, audiences can sometimes fail to consider idols as no more than dolls that exist for their entertainment, removed of any autonomy, devoid of emotions and complexity, ending up in what could best be described as dollification, where the performer is seen as nothing more than a doll, existing to entertain and visually appeal, 
When the audience's perception is challenged though, and the performer expresses humanity, whether it's engaging in a romantic relationship, speaking out against injustice, or even making a mistake, this dissonance can lead to fans reacting negatively, which results in the frequent occurrence of idols being cyberbullied, and even stalked by fans who try to reach through to them to apologise or change their ways in order to suit their narrative. Understandably, this all takes a toll on their already fragile mental state. Because of this brutal lifestyle where idols are physically and emotionally tested by their music label and fans, there are understandably repercussions to this. Many performers in the industry suffer from consistent depression, anxiety and exhaustion. Although some idols have been open about their struggles with mental illness in interviews, there is still very much a taboo, and it's expected of them to maintain a facade of happiness, energy and perfection for fans. Bear in mind that when K-pop stars are going through the process of becoming an idol, it's during their formative teenage years, it can alter their perception of the world and take a tremendous mental toll. After their debut, they're put in front of the world to be judged by the public, where they have to meet the ludicrously high expectations of their fans and endure criticisms about their appearance, performances and even sexist remarks on social media. In an article by Teen Vogue about how discussing mental health is a taboo in K-pop, they mentioned that when they reached out to talk to an artist about their hardships, their management outright refused them to ask any questions about it. Sugar and RM from BTS have been more open about their struggles with depression and anxiety, and even mention that they've been seeking professional help. When talking to the Korean outlet Yonhap, Suga said that anxiety and loneliness seem to be with me for life. Emotions are so different in every situation and every moment, so I think to agonize every moment is what life is. Members of BTS are a rare exception in the industry though, as their label has given them far more way in the space of their personal life and even creativity, going as far as to allow them to take two months holidays. However, BTS aren't under one of the big three K-pop labels, YG Entertainment, SM Entertainment and JYP Entertainment. Despite BTS's tremendous success, these three labels are the most successful in the industry, with some of the biggest bands signed to them. They also have a reputation for treating their artists poorly, putting them through extreme training processes like the ones mentioned, along with maintaining their personal lives and public image. Like many other East Asian countries, South Korea has an unhealthy tendency to ignore mental illness and mental health. South Korea has one of the worst approaches to mental health in the industrialized world, and the highest suit side rate of any country in Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, or OECD, at 23 deaths per every 100,000 persons. Much like countries such as Japan, many in South Korea see depression, anxiety and other mental illnesses as a weakness and elect to ignore symptoms or not take them very seriously. The use of medications such as antidepressants is also low, but there's also been little research into the prevalence of mental health medication usage in the country. Incidentally, alcoholism is a massive problem in South Korea, where they have the highest rate of liquor consumption of any country in the world, averaging at 14 shots per person per week, which is double the rate of Russia. Despite being adored by millions across the world, K-pop idols aren't immune to a culture that routinely refuses to acknowledge mental illness, and as a result, there has been an alarming rate of artists that have taken their lives due to the demands of the industry, and a lifestyle that denies them of their autonomy, emotions and intimacy. In December 2017, Jong Hyun, real name Kim Jong Hyun from the band Shiny, took his life, and in a note he left behind, he mentions how the pressure of being a celebrity in South Korea drove him to depression. Kim also wrote that his doctor had previously blamed his personality for his inability to escape his depression. He also said, Maybe I wasn't supposed to come up against the world. Maybe I wasn't supposed to be known to the world. I've learned that's what makes my life difficult. How come I chose that? He died aged 27. In October 2019, the singer Sully, real name Choi Jin Ri of the group FX, ended her life after a long battle with depression, which she had regularly been open about. She was also outspoken about South Korea's negative attitudes towards mental illness and the online abuse that celebrities have to endure. She left behind a note, the contents of which were not revealed to the public, but were described as pessimistic about life. She died aged 25. Only one month later, in November 2019, after returning from a break in May due to hospitalization after an alleged attempt at taking her life, the singer Gu Hara made a comeback, during which she would apologize to her fans for causing concerns and a commotion. 
Her last post on Instagram was from the night before her death, which was a picture of herself in bed with the caption, Good night. She died aged 28. The common thread among each one of these artists and many others like them is that the pressure of the industry, their treatment by fans and South Korea's culture of ignoring mental illness contributed to their anguish. They had no real chance to have a normal life, constantly guarding their reputation, trying to have some semblance of a private life and desperately trying to maintain the glossy, immaculate exterior expected of an idol. These deaths did not need to happen. They could have had a better support system, but so long as the industry keeps stretching young and vulnerable people like this, this will keep on happening. And unfortunately, if you're a K-pop fan, I really hate to tell you this, but you're complicit. Idols are just like many other products in our lives. Like your phone, your laptop, or even your clothing. They're created in conditions in which humans have to suffer to create them to make your life better in some way. You may see idols on stage, in music videos, or in interviews as these beautiful, happy people that exude confidence, but they're just as vulnerable as you, if not more so. Because even though there's no proper way to grow up, it's undeniable that what they're subjected to in order to satiate the demands of fans and the desire for profit from their labels is not producing happy and well-adjusted human beings. Idols within the industry are created on a conveyor belt. They're made by design based on what the fans want and what the label thinks will give them the highest return on investment. These companies are exploiting your desire to see gorgeous people singing pleasant, optimistic music and they do whatever they can to hide the cruel and brutal process that goes into creating that. As cynical and disgusting as it sounds, even the death of an idol benefits a music label, as it causes a surge in sales and interest of the survival surviving members of the artist's band, but this is the nature of an industry that only cares about profiteering and outright refuses to change how things are because what they do now is so successful at creating superstars. I don't want to tell you that you shouldn't like K-pop. I'm sure there are many fans out there who will listen to the music, buy merchandise and go to concerts, but be perfectly aware of how appalling the nature of this industry can be. But if you truly care about the people who have made your life better through their music, then you should do what you can to stop these labels from denying idols their happiness and humanity. The K-pop industry exhibits a callous disregard for human lives. It turns living, vulnerable young men and women into commodities, designed and crafted by committee to maximize profits and sold to you, the consumer. And when those products become obsolete, the industry simply moves on to the next model and asks us to forget about the previous one. It is a ruthlessly efficient machine that produces stars, but it's powered by blood. And even though we might be aware of that, it's easy for people to ignore when the packaging is so attractive and the sounds they make help you feel better. This machine may be efficient at making idols, but it's also far more efficient at ruining their lives, whether it intends to or not. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, then please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you could click on that notification bell as well next to the subscribe button, I would be extremely grateful of that since YouTube has been burying my videos lately. If you would like, you can also help me on Patreon. Even if you want to chip in as much as a dollar, it's greatly appreciated. All these lovely people that you see here help make these videos possible. And I would like to give a special thank you to the following. Lexi Weiss, Fraser, Mariam, Mia Huxley, Marius Stubberud, Brendan Wilkinson, Venter, Floofpants, Tamara, Catherine Engelman, Steve Marr, and Neve Breslin. You're all amazing people and your support means the world to me. Also, don't forget to follow me on Twitter, that is at SolariTV, you should see a link in the description. And I'm gonna start streaming again soon, I was just taking a bit of a break from it, but yeah, I'll be back soon. Thanks once again, enjoy the rest of your day. Don't support K-pop, take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Bye bye.